Welcome. Grab your favorite morning beverage and join us for Morning Cannolis with Jim Santel. You don't know me, but I'm your brother. Sampling the news desserts of the week, here is your host, Jim Santel. And good morning, America. Good morning, the great Midwest. Good morning, Wisconsin and cities in and around the Midwest and around America, including right here in Waukesha. My name is Jim Santel. This is Morning Cannolis. It's our second show just after our inaugural show last week, our second show this morning. We're coming to you live from the WAUK studios right here on Wisconsin Avenue in downtown Waukesha. Delighted to be with you again today. Thank you so much for tuning in. It is a pleasure to have you with us. And during the course of the next couple of hours, we're also going to take your phone calls. So write the phone number down right now, 844-967-2789, 844-967-2789. This is Morning Cannolis with Jim Santel. I'm going to be with you for the next couple of hours. And believe it or not, this morning, Connor, who is my producer this morning, and I do, in fact, have real cannolis here in the studio. I Hopefully, Mike will be able to clean up for us afterwards. Real cannolis here this morning on Saturday, July 11th, 2022. Our second show and establishing our traditions here at WAUK, 540 AM, 101 FM, The Shaw in Waukesha, right here in downtown Waukesha. We begin with a little bit of history, a little bit of getting a sense of where we are in the life and livelihood of our nation, our state, our community. This is the 162nd day of the year 2022. What happened? What happened on this day in history? A number of great, important things in the history of our world, the history of our nation, too. It was way back in 1184 B.C., we all remember that, right? That many historians believe that Troy was sacked by the Greeks beginning today, uh, 1184 B.C. 1509, Henry VIII, Henry VIII at the ripe old age of 17 years old, married his first, his first wife, Catherine of Aragon, at the age of 23. You recall that history as well. Pope Clement VII refused to annul that wedding when Henry decided he wanted to move on to his second wife, and that established the English Reformation, a break with the church, and again, a change in the world. 1776, well, a little bit closer to our present day, a couple hundred years ago. Today was the day, June 11th, uh, 1776. The Continental Congress got together to create this committee, Folks named J Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, Ben Franklin, Roger, Simon, Robert Livingston, others out there who decided that it was time to put together a thing called the Declaration of Independence, beginning drafting that today, June 11th, 1776. A little bit more recently, eh, not too recently, 1898, uh, this is the day that Spain declared war on the United States of America. 600 of our Marines landed at Guantanamo, Cuba, 1898, June 11th. 1982, jumping a little bit forward here. Today was the day that E.T. was released. In 1993, Steven Spielberg brought us Jurassic Park, jumping back just a little bit, a little bit more seriously. It was today in 1963, issues very much relevant to today, that George Wallace, Governor George Wallace, uh, said that he would not permit the integration of the University of Alabama preventing black students from attending, from walking through the doors of that university. Also today that JFK, the same day, June 11, 1963, said segregation is morally wrong. It is truly time to act. John F. Kennedy, our president at that time, articulating what was to come, civil rights laws in the following days, weeks, months and years that, again, affected dramatically our arc toward the perception of and the reality of a more decent and fair nation. Very, very recently, Timothy McVeigh, 2001, the fellow who was responsible for the deaths of about 168 people, more than, more than that, injured at the Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City when he bombed it in April of 1995, 
Timothy McVeigh uh, put to death today, uh, June 11, 2001, by the federal government. Uh, 2010, the World Cup football uh, tournament, uh, first time soccer, soccer, right, um, was held in South Africa, the first time in the history of the World Cup in South Africa. And finally, uh, 2014 was the date also that the Islamic State of Iraq began to attack in Mosul. And finally, finally, uh, 2021, today was a day in 2021, June 11th, that Darnella Frazier, remember that name? Darnella Frazier, this young woman who was there at the time that George Floyd was murdered on the streets of Minneapolis. She took pictures of that. She took video of that. And today was the day in 2021, just a couple of years ago, a year or so ago, that uh, the Pulitzer Committee uh, honored her with a special uh, citation for her work on that day. Lots of important things happening on June 11th, uh, 2022, and in years prior. I'm so glad to have you with us today. We're at the uh, uh, WAUK studios right here in downtown Waukesha. It's 5.40 a.m., 101 FM. This is The Shaw in Waukesha. I want to thank once again Mike Crute and all the wonderful staff of WAUK for inviting me to be with you again this morning. We're going, going to have a conversation this morning about a number of different issues uh, that are important to our life and our livelihood. Uh, not just here in Wisconsin, not just here in the state of Wisconsin, but throughout our nation and, frankly, throughout our world. So let's jump right into that. Let's begin to talk about the important issues of the day. Last week, last week, you will recall very well that we spent most, if not all, of the hour and the hour that followed our 9 o'clock uh, setting talking about guns. We recall very well uh, all of the horrors of recent times and, frankly, historical times as well. We have the shootings, obviously, in Tulsa, Uvalde, and Buffalo, many other places around the nation just in recent days and weeks. It prompted us last week to step back and talk about what the law is under the Second Amendment of the United States Constitution, again, authored by people like George Mason and James Madison many, many years ago. What does that mean and we spent most of the hour talking about this case called Heller, H-E-L-L-E-R, decided just about 14 years ago this month, June 26, 14 years ago, Justice Antonin Scalia telling us what the Second Amendment, from his perspective, and yes, the perspective of a majority of the Supreme Court, means today. It was the first time, as you recall from our discussion last week, that the United States Supreme Court decided that there was, in fact, an individual right an individual right to gun ownership. It was reasonably narrow, but very significant because in pre four previous instances, the United States Supreme Court had, had expressly declined, declined to identify in the language, in the history of the Second Amendment, a notion that there was an individual right, an individual right to gun ownership. What they did in Heller is decide that indeed with respect to your home, the privacy of your home, when you're inside your home, you do have in fact a constitutional right to own and carry and presumably use for self-defense, a traditional purpose in the law, self-defense in your home using a gun. That was Heller, all right? And for all the past 14 years that has been, and it remains to this day, good law here in Wisconsin, here throughout uh, cities in the Midwest, throughout the United States of America. That remains good law to this time. And the reason I emphasize that, of course, is that we're going to be anticipating yet another decision, the most current decision, the most significant decision by the United States Supreme Court since Heller, since 14 years ago, since we heard from Justice Scalia at that time and a majority of the Supreme Court. There's another case that's going to be decided very, very soon, probably when we get together here, perhaps next week, maybe in the next uh, several weeks, a very significant case called New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus Bruin, B-R-U-E-N, B-R-U-E-N. And why is that case so important? Well, we talked about this again last week. Let's go back and reach and chat more about that, revisit that just a little bit. Uh, this is a case involving uh, two individuals in New York State. Their names are Robert Nash and Brandon, and Brandon Koch. And both of them had applied under the thing called the Sullivan Act in New York for permission, permission to carry their weapons in open places. 
on the streets, on the sidewalks of America, certainly in the streets and sidewalks of New York State. Uh, under the Sullivan Act, they were required, before they could do that, to make an application to the New York authorities, in particular Bruin, who is at the time the superintendent of the New York State Police and others in those positions of responsibility, made a request to come forward and uh, 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 seek uh, authorization to do just that, carry a weapon outside of their home. So right after the break, we're going to get back to that, talk more about that. We're going to take your calls as well, following up, and then later today, we're going to be talking also about privacy rights. Uh, write down 844-967-2789. Following up again a little bit more with guns and then spending most of our morning today talking about privacy rights. Another big case coming up in the Supreme Court. We'll continue that discussion with you here at Morning Cannolis with Jim Santel here at WAUK. the significance of that ruling, very likely based upon the oral arguments in November of last year that a majority of the Supreme Court will probably find, including the Chief Justice, a majority of the Supreme Court will almost certainly find that in 2022, sometime this month, sometime next month, the ruling in Heller should in fact be expanded so that you do in fact have a constitutional right apart from government oversight, apart from government applications and authorizations to carry a, we a weapon in public. We don't know exactly how that's going to come out. We can't predict with absolute certainty, but likely based upon the tea leaves that we're reading from last fall, that will be the change in American jurisprudence, a huge change plainly, an expansion of Second Amendment rights at a time when our nation is also reeling, reeling from disasters, calamities, which we heard about again this past week as members of our nation, citizens, residents, including an 11-year-old girl, talked about the horror that she had to face in Uvalde as uh, 21 of her classmates and teachers were gunned down there by an automatic weapon. So um, we're going to take your questions and comments here as well as those come in. Um, the reason for my revisiting this a little bit is because some of you had asked during the course of the past week about something I commented about just at the end of the two-hour period last time. That is, the things we can do um, under Heller, which again remains good law. Presumably that also remains good law even after Bruin is issued. When that happens, the Supreme Court will tell us what kinds of conditions can be placed upon things like ownership, use, possession, other things related to the uh, open carry, the concealed carry of weapons on our streets and, and, and on our sidewalks. And so one of the things that I offered in fairly short order toward the end of our time last Saturday was a number of different options, which you know well. You've heard about these a lot. And many of you, as I say, followed up with me and asked me to talk a little bit more about some of those. We talked about background checks. What are those? Well, if you are an FFL, which is a fancy federal way of saying if you're authorized by the federal government to sell weapons, to sell firearms, as those are defined in the federal code, um, that, that, that it is possible, it is possible um, for you to buy those weapons if, in fact, if, in fact, you pass a background check. It's a fairly expedited process. Um, you have to go and undergo a, a check to make certain that you are eligible to, in fact, um, obtain a weapon. And, um, and an FFL, a properly authorized dealer, will, in fact, sell you a weapon if, in fact, you pass those background checks. The reason why that's so significant and the reason why we talk about the universality of that is that up, up until now, there is still, there is still huge... Uh, loopholes for that, um, including at gun shows, including in private sales. Uh, if you're at gun shows, you're at private sales out of your house, out of your car, you are not subject to those FFL, those officially authorized salesman obligations under the federal law. And so one of the great petitions, one of the great movements forward passed again by the House of Representatives just this past week was to make background checks, these checks on people to make certain that all of us who have guns are properly uh, able to to use and to possess weapons, that that become universal, regardless of how or where under what circumstances you uh, purchase a weapon. 
uh, there's another, at least one or two others, and, that, and they come directly out of our recent experiences in America, having to do with these um, automatic weapons, these weapons that truly are weapons of war. As I mentioned last time when I was in Iraq, saw the impact of them. We saw the impact of AR-15s, automatic rifles again, just in recent weeks. They are there to mow people down, as horrific as that is to say. They're weapons of war, and for that reason, an awful lot of continuing advocacy to prohibit their sales of those kinds of weapons entirely, or at a minimum, to move the age at which you can, in fact, purchase those from 18 to 21. That's also a part of the House of Representatives package of legislation heading over to the Senate. And the final thing I'll I'll represent this morning, indicate uh, by way of description, is that there are also these things called red flag laws. Sometimes they're called ERPOs, sometimes called LVPOs, depending upon the acronym you want to use. Basically situations where if indeed you identify in a family member, a friend, someone out there, and law enforcement also involved in that process, identify as somebody who may be a threat to themselves or to other people out there, a possibility that you should not be because of your psychiatric, mental stability, should not have a weapon, should not have access to that, to do harm to yourself or to other people. Under ERPOs, you can go into court and ask a judge based upon a finding, based upon um, uh, various other standards and practices and policies and, and conditions, ask a judge to temporarily, temporarily remove that weapon from you. Obviously, a, a significant Part of the judicial process would be to determine the basis for that. This is not automatic. You can't simply file the application and then the gun goes away. That's not what these are all about. But they ensure that people who should not have weapons temporarily because of a mental incapacity, in fact, uh, have the the, um, ability, the courts have the ability then to order the removal of those guns those are reviewed routinely to ensure that there is not a permanent a permanent uh, prohibition on gun ownership. And that also, a part of the legislation coming out of the United States House of Representatives this past week, going over to the Senate, where again, as we talked last week, there is this package being promoted, being organized, if you will, by Chris Murphy, a United States senator, hoping to put together a consortium of senators identifying perhaps as many needs to identify at least uh, 10 Republicans who would go along with a fairly tepid, a fairly limited package of remedies, not including bans on AR-15s, but perhaps doing some other things with respect to the age of purchase and maybe a few other things around the edges having to do with the maintenance of guns inside your home. Certainly not the uh, elaborate but most appropriate and effective package passed by the House of Representatives. That's still going forward. And so those are the things that we chatted about a little bit last week, the things that we talked about when it comes to what can be done. And again, under Heller, getting back to the Supreme Court, Justice Scalia and the Supreme Court said to us that you can, in fact, impose those conditions on manufacture, sale, transfer, use, and the circumstances of those. In the Bruin case, likely the Supreme Court is going to expand Heller to include the constitutional right to carry a weapon, perhaps open carry, closed carry. We'll wait to see exactly how they describe this. But that also almost certainly going to be limited by conditions on the places, the places, the venues, the locations where you can, in fact, use guns and where you can't. And certainly a lot of discussion at the time of the oral argument about those circumstances, including places like houses of worship, places like schools, places like hospitals, places like shopping malls, sports venues, other things like that, all of which, all of which we well know have been the subjects of horrific uses of firearms in recent times. So that's our review of last week. In the next 90 minutes or so, we're going to be chatting about another Supreme Court case coming up soon. It's called Dobbs. It is the big one, the other big one out there that's going to be decided fairly soon. We're going to talk about that right after the break. Come back. Stay with us. WAUK Waukesha right here, 540 AM, 101 FM, The Shaw in downtown Waukesha.
Good morning once again. This is Jim Santel. You're here with me in the studio, as is Connor, my producer. This is Morning Cannolis with Jim Santel. We're actually eating cannolis this morning in the studio in the midst of a very serious discussion. Uh, we were just finishing up some retread, if you will, some reconsideration of a few things we chatted about last week in connection with this very significant guns case. It's going to be decided by the Supreme Court quite soon, quite soon in Bruin, B-R-U-E-N, whether or not we have a constitutional right to carry weapons, open carry, concealed carry in the streets and sidewalks, perhaps other places of America. And throughout the morning on every single program coming up, we'll take callers on here at uh, WAUK, 540 AM, 101 FM at the Shaw and Waukesha. And one of those callers is Mark. Mark, you've been waiting on the line patiently uh, for the first half an hour or so. Glad to have you with us again, Mark, today. And uh, your comments or questions, thoughts or perspectives to share with us this morning. Oh, it, it, thanks for taking my call, Jim. It's um, great to talk to you again. It is amazing to me that the Alito's... Uh, likely decision on some of the stuff on, on the whole privacy issue and tie that into this. I mean, that they're going to probably, they likely may expand rights to carry weapons wherever the hell we want to, yet they feel perfectly fine with restricting, you know, that, uh, you know, women's rights to bodily autonomy and uh, ignoring, you know, the rights, privacy rights that have been established over the past, you know, forty some years, that uh, and they talk about direct enumeration in the Constitution, and that, uh, of course, under the Ninth Amendment, it says that just because rights are new, just because we've mentioned some rights, and it doesn't constru- it's not to construe that uh, we've enumer- you know, that uh, people have certain uh, that people have certain rights. I mean, that did. They, they just have these rights, and they don't need to be enumerated. I mean, that uh, exactly. the whole enumeration right. issue in the con- in the Constitution is something that you know Hamilton and, and addressed in or Madison addressed in forty four, saying they didn't enumerate everything. The Constitution government might be called upon to promote the general welfare of the people because that is enumerated. That part of the go- job of our government is to promote the general welfare. And part of that general welfare may may actually be to restrict restrict the carrying of firearms wherever the hell we want to carry firearms. Right. Because I'm not going to feel comfortable. I'm a hunter and I'm a gun owner, and I don't, would not feel comfortable walking around and seeing every everybody and their brother wearing wearing something strapped to their, their you know, to their side, or potentially having something concealed on them. That is just something we got away from. I mean, we hear about the days of the old Wild West and the way that some of those marshals cleaned up the towns is by when you when you come into town, you turn your weapons into the marshal's office, right. and, and you can pick them up when you go back out on the trail. Right, and Mark, Mark, I think um, I thank you so much for those observations, not only because uh, they fall right in line with our discussion this morning and previously, which you were also a part of, but uh, to underscore your point, yes, Ninth Amendment, uh, lots of things reserved to the states, reserved to the people, not the Constitution, but going back to the very first uh, words in the Constitution, right, we the people, to do what? to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. That's the reason why we have a Constitution. And Mark, I thank you so much again for the observations this morning and the uh, very on-point uh, views about what could and could not happen here in America coming up. And it's also the perfect segue, Mark, thanks so much for that, into our much-related discussion this morning for the remainder of our time together here, Morning Cannolis with Jim Santel, talking about this not directly related, but certainly in the same vein, Mark, as you just said, uh, Supreme Court addressing once again uh, issues that have been the subject of controversial opinions in the past. This is uh, the one that obviously many, many people are chatting about. Uh, We're talking uh, once again about the uh, case in Dobbs, D-O-B-B-S, and that's the word you need to think about, the, the language, that's the, the name of the Supreme Court case that will also, like Bruin, be decided sometime probably in the next a few weeks or so, almost certainly by next month at this time, if not sooner. I'm going to talk, as Mark just introduced us all, to the notion of privacy rights, because that's where this comes from. That's where, that's where Roe versus Wade comes from. Roe versus Wade did not spring completely 
uh, from uh, the pen of Harry Blackman in 1973. It was followed a, a long, long a, a litany, if you will, of cases. And I want to spend a little bit of time in the remaining periods of this hour talking about uh, privacy rights, where we get to Roe versus Wade, and then chat about what's going on with the Supreme Court in connection with privacy rights, the implications of that, and what we might anticipate what we might anticipate when Dobbs is issued, along with Bruin, coming up fairly soon. And so I begin every program, every Saturday here, with a recitation of some of the major historical events in our nation and in our world. Here's your party question. You can uh, uh, entertain guests with this in the future. What two major events happened in American history on January 22, 1973? January 22nd, 1973. I will answer them for you now, and then you can use this uh, to uh, talk uh, brightly, as you always do, with others in your family and uh, group of friends. Two things happened of great import on January 2nd of 1973. One is that Lyndon Johnson, the 36th president of the United States of America, died. He was, as you know, the architect of the Great Society program, and uh, I was on that day, January 22, 73, that um, we mourned his passing and uh, the all-important uh, civil rights legislation, obviously, that he initiated during the course of his term that stays with us to this day, that moves us forward toward that time of uh, a more perfect union that we anticipate under the Constitution. The other significant thing that happened on January 22nd of 1973 is that, that that was the day that the High Court, our United States Supreme Court, ruled in, uh, in Roe versus Wade that, in fact, there is a constitutional right, a constitutional right to abortion, as specifically to make decisions about reproductive rights. We're going to get back to that in just a few moments as we chat more about what Roe versus Wade said and did not say. But let's step back even beyond what happened for what happened on January 22nd and talk about some of the predicates for that. We know way back in, in 1948, certainly privacy rights existed before then, but we know in 1948, in December of that year, the United Nations came out with a, a declaration of human rights. It was Article 12 and said, no one shall be subject to arbitrary interference with his, and I'd offer her, privacy, family, home, correspondence, nor attacks upon his or her honor and reputation. Everyone, the United Nations said, has the right to the protection of a law against such interference or attacks on privacy. That was way back in 1948. Let's move, uh, actually, before that uh, to the 1920s and get into the United States Supreme Court in our nation, because it was way back in the 1920s that the United States Supreme Court began to articulate this notion that there is a privacy right. Again, the word privacy does not, as Mark and others have indicated this morning, does not appear expressly in the, Supreme, in the Constitution. But the Supreme Court began to identify back in the 1920s this notion that indeed, uh, by virtue of all of the provisions of the Constitution, including the Bill of Rights, which we'll also get to, that there is a hint, if you will, of privacy rights. How do they do that? Well, there was a case called Meyer versus Nebraska way back in 1923. 1923, and uh, in that case, the Supreme Court beginning to talk about this notion that families and parents and people uh, engaged in, in privacy interests should have a right uh, to uh, be learned, be educated broadly. And so the Supreme Court in 1923, Meyer versus Nebraska, said that a state law that prohibited, obviously Nebraska, from the teaching of German um, and other foreign languages before the ninth grade could not stand could not stand. You can't limit that kind of educational curriculum. And again, began to talk about this fundamental notion of privacy rights. About two years later, in a case called Pierce versus Society of Sisters, the United States Supreme Court also kind of revisited this issue, not explicitly, but said that it was unconstitutional for the Oregon legislature, moving a bit west now, the Oregon legislature, to mandate compelling all children, all children, to attend public schools. Again, a privacy right of families, of parents, of individuals, to make decisions about where students, their children, should go to school. Both Meyer and Pierce began to suggest began to suggest that there is, in fact, this thing called privacy rights established under the Constitution. 
acknowledged by the Supreme Court. We move ahead just a few years to 1928, a case called Olmstead, O-L-M-S-T-E-A-D, 1928. The Supreme Court was wrestling at that time with what, the question of whether or not this newfangled thing called, the, called telephones uh, could in fact uh, be used uh, to, for investigative purposes by law enforcement to, to uh, record uh, conversations. And in that particular case, the Supreme Court was deciding whether there was a privacy right in your telephone conversations, 1928 and before. Right after the break, here we're going to chat with you about what that means, what that case in Olmstead said, and why it began to put us in the direction of a clear establishment of privacy rights in America, uh, not just in, in 1928, but to this day, to this day in 2022. We'll talk more about Olmstead heading toward Roe versus Wade, heading toward Dobbs uh, this morning on Morning Cannolis with Jim Santel. And we're back once again. This is Morning Cannolis with Jim Santel. I'm at the studio in downtown Waukesha. This is The Shah, W-A-U-K, 101 FM, 540 AM, The Shah in Waukesha. We're talking this morning about this additional Supreme Court case coming up fairly soon. Uh, could be this week, could be in the weeks just ahead. Which the Supreme Court's going to be deciding the breadth, the scope of privacy rights in 2022. And I'm just doing a little bit of a history of where we got to this point, how we got to this notion of establishing privacy rights in our Constitution, chatting right before the break about Olmstead, a case in which the Supreme Court was wrestling with whether or not you have a privacy right in your conversations on the telephone way back in 1928. Believe it or not, the Supreme Court at that point, in a case was subsequently overruled, rejected, and overturned, the Supreme Court in Olmstead found that you did not have a privacy right. But along the way, in Olmstead, a fellow named Louis Brandeis, an icon, a lion of the Supreme Court, wrote a dissent. And it's important to listen to this because it really is one of the great articulations of privacy rights that remains good law um, as he describes it, even though he was in the dissent in Olmstead uh, in a case called Katz overruling that, uh, his view became the majority view of the United States Supreme Court. This is what Louis Brandeis, Justice Louis Brandeis, said. He said, the makers of our Constitution understood the need to secure conditions favorable to the pursuit of happiness and the protections guaranteed by this are much broader in scope, he wrote, and include the right to life and to an inviolate personality, the right to be left alone, that great language that we think about an awful lot when we consider rights to privacy. This most comprehensive of rights, the most uh, the right most valued by civilized men, and again, I would offer women as well. And so he went on, subject to uh, understanding of the place that this comes from in in Olmstead, his descent in Olmstead, to say the principle underlying the Fourth and Fifth Amendments is protection against invasions of the sanctities of a man's or woman's home and privacies of life. This is a recognition, Brandeis said, of the significance of one's spiritual nature, his or her feelings, and his or her intellect. Again, a descent in Olmstead way back in way back in 1928, and that leads leads to the groundwork for one of the seminal cases that brings us current. It's a case called Griswold versus Connecticut. It's 1965, so we jump ahead a couple of decades here. 1965, and the Supreme Court once again has before it a question of whether there is privacy under the Constitution. What is the dimension of that? How does this come about? Well, uh, way back in 1961, uh, two troublemakers, two good troublemakers, I would offer, named Estelle Griswold and Lee Buxton. Uh, Estelle Griswold is the executive director of Planned Parenthood in Connecticut, and Lee Buxton is Dr. Lee Buxton. He's the chair of the Yale Medical School's Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. They opened their doors uh, to a new reproductive services clinic in New Haven, Connecticut, and they knew, they knew when they did that in November of 1961 that they were going to run afoul of something called the Comstock Law not only in Connecticut, but many other states in the Union, a Comstock law, a stock law that prohibits any person, here's the language from that law, from using a drug, medicinal article, or instrument for the purpose of pre pre uh, preventing conception. If you violate that law, you can be arrested, 
You can be fined up to $100 for each violation. You can be tried, convicted, and sure enough, sure enough, um, Estelle Griswold and Lee Buxton, within hours, probably days, they find themselves before the state court in violation of the Comstock law for opening their clinic and as a result of what they do, in fact, um, it, uh, say that morning, um, they, they are convicted by the uh, uh, court in, in uh, Connecticut for violating that law. Uh, goes up to the Supreme Court, and the question is whether or not that conviction that is affirmed by the state Supreme Court as well can stand, can stand. And the Supreme Court, for the first time, for the first time, says to us that, yes, indeed, there is a privacy right uh, in the Constitution. William Douglas, another lion in the area of civil rights, human rights in America, writes for a 7-2 to two majority in Griswold versus Connecticut. Griswold is the name of the case. He says this, our previous cases, including things like the other cases out of the 1920s that we just discussed, uh, suggest that specific guarantees in the Bill of Rights have penumbras. There's your word uh, for this morning, for this afternoon, for the day. Penumbras formed by emanations from those guarantees that help give them life and substance. Various guarantees, he says, create zones of privacy. That's what William Douglas says, writing behalf of a majority of the Supreme Court at that time. He goes on to say, we have uh, many had many controversies over these penumbral rights of privacy and repose. These cases bear witness that the right of privacy, which presses for a recognition here, is in fact a legitimate one. And so we get in 1965, the first time, the first clear articulation, again, hints back in the 1920s and certainly other cases that there's this existed. Supreme Court tells us in 1965 there is a constitutional right to privacy in this case called Griswold. This this uh, very important opinion written by Justice Douglas at that time and it sets the stage for everything else that, that follows. Now we know we know based upon not only Mark's very good call this morning already that there are differences in opinion coming right out of Griswold about where that comes from. Where does the word privacy come from? Well, it's not as I said in the Constitution language itself, but we know. Oh, we know that Supreme Court justices find it, find it in various areas. Uh, we know, for example, again, I just read the, the penumbra language, if you will, from Justice Douglas that a majority pretty much signs on to. But there are other notions uh, behind this as well. And so you get, for example, um, Justice Harlan, who says, uh, who concurs in the overall opinion, but says that you find that in the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment, that's where he finds privacy. Uh, Justice Goldberg at the time finds it, Mark, in the Ninth Amendment as you just indicated earlier today, establishing that simply because the Constitution explicitly describes certain rights, that doesn't mean that others do not exist. And that's sufficient authority, according to Goldberg. Byron White uh, took an even more traditional, accessible, kind of rational basis approach. And he says, I wholly fail to see how the ban on the use of contraceptives by married couples in any way reinforces the state's ban on illicit sexual relationships. And so despite these differences internally about where this privacy right comes from, Virtually all of the justices, at least seven of them back in 1965, say yes, indeed, it exists. This zone of privacy that uh, Justice Douglas talked about is out there, and it gives rise then to a whole series of cases that follow. And let me do just a little bit of exposition of that, and I'm going to take some callers right after this before we head into Roe versus Wade in particular. Based upon this constitutionally-based right to privacy that, that is now acknowledged in, in Griswold, um, all sorts of other things happen both before and after Roe versus Wade. And so, for example, uh, we had a caller uh, was calling in over the break, um, appreciate very much Chuck from Madison, asking about uh, medical treatment and uh, even, even rights to suicide, those kinds of things. Well, it turns out that um, in 1990, in 1990, using this privacy right, uh, the United States Supreme Court said that the capacity to terminate life-prolonging medical treatments and health care generally, decisions about health care and, and the ways that we move forward in our lives and, and perhaps even end our lives, those are protected under privacy rights. All right, That's 1990. Go back a little bit. Uh, 1972, uh, the uh, ruling in Griswold has expanded to provide access to contraceptives for unmarried couples. Griswold just applied to married couples, believe it or not. That was 1972. Juveniles. Juveniles, their privacy right, access to contraceptives, that's in 1977, got to be at least 16 years of age. That's expanded in 1977. Let's jump around here a little bit. Um, also in 1977, 
uh, the prerogatives of families to decide how they define their households. Uh, there was a grandmother who had identified her household as being one in which her grandchildren were that were present. And the Supreme Court said, uh, you can't intrude in that decision. The decision about how households are going to be put together, that also a part of a privacy right protection, uh, penumbras and other protections in the Supreme Court. 1967, many of you recall this case, the rights of interracial couples to marry. That was 1967, a case most appropriately called Loving versus, versus Virginia, the Loving Couple. Uh, quite literally, that is their last name. Right for interracial couples to marry, 1967. 2015, we all know in Obergefell, uh, the United States Supreme Court said the right of same-sex couples to marry. That's a privacy right coming out of 2015. 1969, the Supreme Court says your, your right to private possession of pornography depicting adults over the age of 18, so some limitations there. Uh, that is also a privacy right that you have. Um, and significantly also the freedom of adults to engage in consensual sexual activities in their homes. 2003, that is a privacy right as well. There are literally tens if not hundreds of these out there that all flow from Griswold and the identification of privacy rights uh, that comes out of 1965. And we march on toward, ultimately, Roe versus Wade in 1973, which we're going to get to in just a moment or so. But I'm going to take a couple of callers. Uh, Connor has brought them on the line. Uh, first, we've got um, CJ from Skokie. CJ, uh, thank you for waiting on me and waiting on us. Um, your comments, your thoughts uh, this morning. I call. Um, <clears throat> I believe uh, the Democrats uh, proved they were weak on crime. Uh, they're now recalling uh, DAs from even San Francisco and Los Angeles. Um, and your party, James, picks and chooses which laws are enforced. Um, is it okay to protest Supreme Court justices in front of their house? No, it's against the law. Your party is, uh, allows it. Um, well, and, okay and you know, CJ, I'm going to inter interrupt you just a little bit here, just because, you know, um, our, our program here, I know we've just been on the air for a couple of, of times here. I'd like to, I'd like to uh, set forth this notion that, that, you know, it's not about partisan politics. Law enforcement, as you and I have talked before, should in fact be something that is apolitical and nonpartisan. Um, and certainly the issues but related. Not for your party. Well, and, and, and as we talked this morning, this morning, about constitutional rights under Roe versus Wade, under the Constitution, privacy rights. We're going to talk about more uh, in the second hour. All those things, uh, the understanding here this morning, CJ, yeah. uh, the, the point this morning. And we're back. This is Jim Santel at the studios of WAUK, 540 AM, 101 FM in downtown Waukesha, right here in Wisconsin Avenue. This morning, this is Morning Cannolis with Jim Santel. I'm here in the studio with Connor, and we're talking, as we did in our first show last week, about the United States Supreme Court. We chatted again a little bit this morning about the significant firearms case coming up fairly soon. And now, and now we're in the midst of discussion about privacy rights leading up to a larger discussion about Roe versus Wade, and then the likely decision of the Supreme Court in a case called Dobbs. Dobbs, that is certainly going to impact dramatically, if not overrule completely, the fundamental decision in Roe versus Wade. Before we get to that, and some of our very good callers who've been waiting on the line here, stick with me. I promise I'll get to you. Just a couple of other things about the United States Supreme Court, because some of you have also asked about this. Supreme Court uh, has already decided in this term, which again begins to end somewhere right around now, June, July or so. Usually last year they issued a few opinions in July. 66 cases, 66 different opinions in a variety of cases uh, already issued in this term. They have 29 cases yet to decide. 29 yet are coming out in the next month or so. Significantly, the United States Supreme Court has identified this coming Monday and again, this coming Wednesday is a, a two dates in which they're going to be issuing opinions. They've got some conferences scheduled for Thursday the 16th, Thursday the 23rd. And if we, I can engage in a bit of prediction here right now, likely that the decisions in Bruin, the guns case, and probably in Dobbs, 
may not be coming out this week, but probably sometime in the weeks ahead. We will certainly be following up on those, as I'm certain the uh, radio station here, WAUK, Mike, Dom, others, Brian, Luke, will talk about those issues uh, routinely. So a little bit of, of history on the Supreme Court and what its uh, present caseload is, what it still has yet to do before it concludes this particular 2021-2022 term. Right before the break, we were chatting about the rights to privacy coming out of Griswold versus Connecticut in 1965 and heading up, heading up to Roe versus Wade in 1973. And let me jump into that just a little bit and talk a little bit about uh, Roe versus Wade, 1973. Harry Blackman writing again for a seven to two majority. Uh, Justice Blackman says that a right to privacy, whether it's founded in the 14th Amendment's concept of personal liberty and restrictions upon state action, as we feel it is, Harry Blackman writes, or in the Ninth Amendment's reservations of rights to the people, is broad enough to encompass a woman's decision whether to terminate her pregnancy. That's basically key language coming out of the decision Roe v. Wade in 1973. Um, he goes on to say a state may properly assert important interests in safeguarding health, maintaining medical standards, protecting potential life. At some point in pregnancy, these respective interests become sufficiently compelling to sustain regulation of the factors that govern the abortion decision. We're going to get back to that in just a moment or so. The case itself, Roe versus Wade, uh, comes out of a petition, a, some litigation initiated by a woman named Norma McCorvey. She is actually Roe of Roe versus Wade. Um, 1969, she became pregnant with her third child. She wanted an abortion, but she lived in Texas where abortion was illegal except to save the mother's life. Uh, her attorneys filed a lawsuit, and they filed it against a district attorney named Henry Wade. That's where the word Wade, the name Wade, comes from. Uh, filed against the local DA on the, on the basis that, that the Texas abortion laws were unconstitutional. The lower courts, the district court in northern Texas, rules in her favor. Uh, and then eventually this gets up to the United States Supreme Court, where, as I said, according to Justice Blackmun and six other members of the Supreme Court, adopting this fundamental notion about privacy rights finds that there is indeed, indeed, a privacy right in the home, in family relations, a privacy right of women, and I would offer men as well, to make decisions about, about uh, pregnancies and about abortion, whether or not to pursue um, an abortion, um, that that is protected by the Supreme Court's decision, Roe versus Wade, again, premised upon this long line of cases uh, establishing privacy rights in America. I want to chat beyond that about what the uh, decision in uh, Roe versus Wade says and what it doesn't say, again, premised upon cases like Meyer and Pierce and Griswold, um, as I just indicated, but also noting that the right is in all things, is in all things. We talked about this in connection with the guns cases as well. That right is not absolute, and as Justice uh, Blackman said, has to be balanced against the government's legitimate, legitimate interest in protecting a woman's health and personal life. And uh, Justice Blackman divides the analysis up then into three trimesters. During the first, the government can impose no restrictions on a woman's right to choose, aside from imposing minimal medical safeguards, and then identifies an increasing state interest in the second trimester and, and a, a significant uh, state interest after that in the third trimester. We're going to get back to that in just a moment or so. But before we do, um, we've got a couple of callers who've been diligently, patiently waiting online for a long period of time. Uh, Dick, you're from Madison. You're calling in. Appreciate your, your time and your thoughts this morning about privacy rights, Roe versus Wade as we head toward a decision in Dobbs. Thanks for being with us. Well, the situation on telephones way back in the 20s is kind of funny when you think about it because my great aunt could listen to her neighbor on the party line well into the 60s. Right. Isn't but that anyway. interesting? Right. It is, it is techno <laughs> yeah. technology advances. Supreme Court has to rule with all these things, deal with all these things the and make Supreme rulings. Court, right? though, what I was going to get to is I think the Supreme Court has become all too supreme. And by what I mean by saying that is this. Um, they seem to be pushing a minority view on a number of issues on the majority of this country, if you look at really where the country stands. And then you've got somebody like Clarence Thomas, who clearly has some huge conflicts of interest when it comes to the January 6th situation, for instance. I don't even feel he should be sitting on the court anymore with all the conflicts of interest that he has. 
but the Supreme Court just in general, uh, you know, the way it sits now, it's not really a reflection of the country anymore, in my opinion. And, Dick, I appreciate that opinion, and thanks so much for calling in and making that observation. You know, it certainly is the case. Uh, the recent polling, once again, when it comes to guns, the great majority of Americans do, in fact, believe in and support, I think it's like 83, 80, 45 percent, reasonable, rational limitations, controls, regulations on the rights of Americans to carry weapons. Uh, we'll see how the, that uh, public uh, view of this is reflected undeniably when it comes to larger issues here uh, related to uh, privacy rights, when it gets to Roe versus Wade, the rights of women to make decisions about their bodies, an overwhelming majority once again in the nation believes that there should in fact be a recognition of that privacy right. And uh, to your very significant point, Dick, the question is whether or not uh, decisions by the Supreme Court coming up very soon will be a reflection of that or perhaps not. And so, Dick, we thank you for that uh, call in, that good observation, and we'll stay tuned to see uh, whether or not your concerns are heard by the Supreme Court or whether or not uh, we get decisions that are somewhat contrary to the overwhelming majority of Americans' opinions. We also have on the phone, uh, I believe you're from Madison, Joe. Glad to have you with us this morning. Uh, Joe, uh, welcome. Uh, we'll, we'll invite your question or comment as well. Um, it's really more of a comment and a, a bit of a story. Uh, uh, we're, you're describing the cases that um, uh, helped establish this uh, idea of privacy uh, from Griswold on, and I wanted to mention just one other case. I, I think you might have recalled it. Griswold was the right of married people to get contraception. That was in 1967. The right of unmarried people to get contraception wasn't established or set, uh, set up until 1972. I had a friend who worked in a pharmacy in, in between that period, and he described the great anguish of uh, single men coming into the pharmacy who wanted to just buy condoms. They wanted to do the right thing, you know, to prevent any, any kind of pregnancy, to prevent any kind of uh, disease transmission at all. So they wanted to buy some condoms. In that period of time, um, they, single men could not unless you were married. And so you had to go up and get the pharmacist to sign off on whether you could get condoms or not. It's been 50 years since that decision has been made. And I think particularly for a lot of conservative listeners, the idea that the state could be deciding whether or not you can be doing something as simple as buying condoms dependent on whether you're married or not. We are so far away from that, and that is one of the... That's one of the rights that we've had for the last 50 years. It comes from this right of privacy. And so when we think about taking that right of privacy away, uh, and you know, maybe not right away that that wouldn't happen, but boy, in states like Oklahoma and Michigan, um, they are, there are legislators in those states talking about taking away the right of birth control for both unmarried and married people. So I offer that story that our rights are accumulating that give us the, our control over our lives and the right to privacy. So let's think real hard about whether we want that right of privacy to be yanked away. And, thanks a lot. Uh, great Joe, show. Joe, great Joe, great Joe, facts and details. Great. Thank, Joe, thanks so much for calling in. Appreciate that. And yes, indeed, you've got it just right. You can join me here any Saturday morning. You can bring your own cannolis, but we'll share ours with you as well. Uh, but you're absolutely right. Uh, 1972 is at a time, as I, I believe I indicated before, that uh, this, this right under uh, Griswold was extended to unmarried couples, the story that you compellingly told, to juveniles in the, at least 16 years of age, 1977, likewise. So, Joe, you've got it right on target. And again, my point, which I'll get back to later in this hour, is that all of those things that derive from privacy rights, even over and beyond the right of a woman to choose uh, to get an abortion or not, all those things have these penumbras, if you will, in many, many areas of our lives, and you've just identified another one that's much related to, to this fundamental notion that we do have a privacy right under the Constitution of the United States of America. Joey, appreciate your comment and your calling in very much. Uh, we'll take other callers, 844-967-2789 as well. Right before we heard from our very good callers here, we were also chatting about this decision by Justice Blackmun in 1973, Roe v. Wade, likely to be overturned or significantly uh, pulled back, if you will, in the coming weeks by a majority of the Supreme Court. We'll get to that based upon the oral argument back in December. Again, Blackmun identifying these three trimesters and telling us that uh, that's the basis upon which states can rule. As we come back from the next break,
We're going to chat about another case called Casey versus Bland Parenthood that further gives us more articulation about what this right is. Stay with us right here at WAUK 540 AM 101 FM. This is Morning Cannolis with Jim Santel, the Shaw in Waukesha, Wisconsin. And we're back once again. This is Morning Cannolis with Jim Santel. I'm here at the WAUK studios in downtown Waukesha talking this morning about another significant case coming up on the docket of the United States Supreme Court, likely to be decided, like the Bruin case, the Guns case, sometime in the next month, probably at or shortly after the 4th of July, maybe beforehand. We're not certain about that, but we know we know that the Supreme Court has wrestled with this because the Supreme Court did, in fact, entertain oral arguments on this Dobbs case, which we'll get to uh, in December of last year. But before we get there, let's provide a little bit more of a predicate for all of that. In addition to 1973, Justice Blackmun, writing on behalf of majority, establishing this right to privacy, to make a decision about abortion under the Constitution. Basically, Blackmun says, regardless of where you find it, Ninth Amendment, uh, 14th Amendment, uh, penumbras, uh, whatever you find a basis for doing it, it's there. It is there. And it's on that basis that he establishes this trimester approach. A number of years later, in 1992, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, along with other justices, issue an opinion called Planned Parenthood versus Casey, C-A-S-E-Y. Casey is the name of the case. You probably heard it as well. It's often regarded as kind of the companion case because she recognizes, as do the other Supreme Court justices, that maybe, just maybe, uh, Justice Blackmun's opinion, while it does affirm this fundamental right, which Justice O'Connor reaffirms in Casey, that is a constitutional right uh, to uh, an abortion, a privacy right under the Constitution, she also says that maybe this trimester approach is a little bit too rigid. And sure enough, uh, as one of the criticisms of, of Roe versus Wade uh, continues to this day is it was highly, highly steeped in the medical uh, position and medical uh, realities of 1973. Um, O'Connor comes along and she says, you know what, uh, we're going to look at viability instead, fetal viability. We're going to abandon pretty much this hard trimester approach and instead looked about whether or not uh, fetal viability is, um, in, that should in fact be the guiding uh, standard, if you will, for governmental interference uh, in a decision by the mother and perhaps the father as well uh, to terminate a pregnancy or not. And so Casey also reaffirms Roe versus Wade, 1992, many other cases that follow that. Um, also Casey sort of overrules sort of a strict scrutiny approach um, and in fact establishes kind of an undue burden test. And in the years that follow Casey, that's significant because many of the challenges to abortion laws um, uh, throughout the United States are premised upon a notion, upon an approach that says, okay, the right may be there, the, the constitutional right to privacy to make a decision, but we're going to impose some burdens on access. And so issues related to who can deliver uh, reproductive rights, uh, what kinds of clinics will be permitted to do this, what are the locations of those, what kinds of counseling can and should be provided uh, by states, all those kinds of things that may or may not have imposed burdens on the right without actually focusing on whether or not the right exists itself. And so for many, many cases and since 1992 and to recent times, the litigation, the challenge here in the abortion area has been on burden, as Justice O'Connor said in 1992. And those cases have proceeded on a regular basis, the Supreme Court, even as late as the last couple of terms, cases coming out of uh, some of our states in the South, have reaffirmed that the right, the right, if it's to mean anything, also means the right to access. And you can't impose uh, undue burdens, as Justice O'Connor said, on that right. By doing so, if state legislatures impose too much of a burden, you are in fact denying the right itself. And so the Supreme Court, until uh, it took up this most recent case, uh, still hasn't decided it, but uh, has indicated that that is still the standard. And to this day, to this day on June 11th of 2022, 
Roe and Casey remain good law in this country. We know that well, uh, just because the Supreme Court has not yet taken up a specific decision here. Before we get to the Dobbs case in particular, coming out of Mississippi, let's take a little bit of a, of a detour and also talk about what happened in Texas, a case called Whole Women's Health versus Jackson. A lot to unpack there as well. We'll be fairly brief before the next break or so, but simply indicating that in the state of Texas, the question uh, was whether or not a six-week, a post-six-week ban on abortions uh, was in fact um, legitimate, whether that was consistent with, with Roe versus Wade. Senate Bill 8, you probably recall this well, only Texas licensing officials were subject to litigation. No government officials could enforce it. Um, and uh, the question was whether or not, number one, that's constitutional, uh, the, the Texas law under Jackson, uh, the Supreme Court in December of last year, December 10th of 2021, found that in fact, um, this gestational act, the AGE Act of 2018, um, or I'm sorry, Senate Bill 18 coming out of Texas, uh, they decided in a number of different rulings not to overturn it. Uh, they basically said uh, that the um, majority of members of the Supreme Court um, would permit some private providers to challenge the constitutionality of the, of the law, um, restricted the capacity of the Attorney General of the United States of America to go in and challenge it, but for the most part kept it in place. And so even to this day, while we're waiting a decision out of Mississippi on Dobbs, that Texas case, that Texas case, Senate Bill 8, um, is also looming out there. It is significant because, because in the end, in the end, the Supreme Court permitted permitted the state of Texas to go ahead with its legislation prohibiting abortions after only six weeks of pregnancy. I don't think there's anybody, regardless of what side of this uh, view, this this issue you're on, what your views are, who would say that that is not inconsistent with Roe versus Wade and Casey. And so we have at least one affirmation, admittedly subtly, uh, from the Supreme Court, indirectly by the Supreme Court, and we've got at least one state, and plainly others, as we'll talk, uh, that have announced, have articulated positions that are contrary to the fetal viability law that uh, Justice O'Connor articulated and others in Casey, certainly Roe versus Wade, Justice Blackman. And that remains the law in Texas to the day. Went back down to the Texas Supreme Court. Uh, the Texas dismissed the challenges to the law, finding the legislation includes emphatic, unambiguous, and repeated provisions establishing that civil litigation by private parties is the exclusive means of enforcing the provisions and effectively upheld that prohibition on abortion after six weeks of pregnancy, really contrary to the fundamental tenets of Roe and Casey. And so that is uh, sort of the not, not insignificant uh, footnote to what's going on right now, but that came out of Texas, right? That was a Texas case. We have the Mississippi case, which is with the basis for Dobbs. And so let's begin to chat about that as we begin to go into our nearly our last half an hour here, focusing on what's coming up next. This is the Gestational Act, Gestational Age Act of 2018 out of Mississippi. The Mississippi legislature um, adopts a law that prohibits abortions after 15 weeks of pregnancy. 15 weeks, and that's significant given what the Supreme Court wrestled with in its oral argument in December. Sole exception for medical emergencies or fetal abnormalities. That's the law coming out of Mississippi. And uh, the asserted legislative justification, among other things, was that the fetus at that stage uh, could in fact feel a pain. We're gonna talk more about that Mississippi abortion law what the Supreme Court wrestles with right now and begin to head in our last half an hour towards some thoughts about what the Supreme Court's going to do and the implications of its opinion in Dobbs right after the break. This is Morning Cannolis with Jim Santel, WAUK, Waukesha, 540 AM, 101 FM.
once again for the final half hour this Saturday, June 11th, 2022. This is Morning Cannolis with Jim Santel. I'm here in the studio of WAUK in downtown Waukesha. I'm here with Connor, who is my producer this morning, taking your phone calls as well at 844-967-2789, 844-967-2789. Just before the break, we were chatting about the case coming out of Mississippi, the Mississippi abortion law, the Gestational Age Act that prohibits abortions after 15 weeks of pregnancy, exceptions for medical emergencies, fetal abnormalities. The question whether or not that can stand We know the Supreme Court has decided pretty much to be hands-off when it comes to a six-week ban coming out of Texas. Remains good law in the state of Texas, inconsistent, I think most people would tell you, uh, with Roe versus Wade and uh, Casey versus Planned Parenthood versus Casey. Nonetheless, the Supreme Court in December uh, entertained oral argument on this and determined, tried to determine at that time by questioning, as they always do, the advocates, the lawyers representing both the state of Texas and others who are uh, challenging that particular law, just as they have in many other cases in the privacy area. And we know from that argument on December 1 of 2021, we got a pretty good sense, pretty good sense of how it is that the Supreme Court is going to rule. We know that Justices Breyer, Kagan, and Sotomayor were pretty unequivocal. Eh, I can eliminate the word pretty from that uh, sentence. They were unequivocal in their support of retaining the viability standard established by Roe and specifically articulated in Casey. So you know that there are three justices who are going to be firm in reaffirming the legitimacy, the continued efficacy of Roe and Casey. And then we've got a couple of other justices out there who were also asking questions that also reveal their positions. Yeah, Justice Kavanaugh, um, who certainly signaled his support for overturning it. He was, he was citing a couple things. That is that um, there have been historical reversals of precedence on many things in the past, and he is right on that. Uh, we can certainly argue about whether or not those reversals uh, move forward. The arc of civil rights and human rights, whether they turn those back, I'd argue that most often the Supreme Court has always moved forward in advancing, expanding the prerogatives of Americans to act and behave consistent with life in a community, but nonetheless affirming civil rights and individual liberties. Um, so he talked about the fact that, you know, nothing unusual in overturning precedent, which certainly signals that he would be inclined to overturn Roe versus Wade and Casey outright um, also talked about judicial neutrality and said, you know, maybe one of the things we can do is we don't specifically declare that uh, this law or the, there is no longer a right, uh, but we simply become neutral. And I would offer that I think that's linguistic gymnastics, if you will, for withdrawing uh, the notion of privacy rights, at least when it comes to abortion rights under the Constitution. We talked about judicial neutrality. We're not going to overrule anything. We're not going to rescind anything. We're just going to vacate the field and become neutral. That was sort of his approach on some of his questions. You also had Justice Amy Coney Barrett, the most recently appointed Supreme Court Justice. And what did she talk about? She talked a lot about post-birth opportunities for adoption instead of abortion, likewise indicating that uh, she would be inclined at least to limit dramatically, if not overturn completely, Roe and Casey. Um, Obviously, the other justices on the conservative side of the bench, likewise indicating that they would be inclined to overrule Roe versus Wade. We have had a lot of focus on this recently when a draft opinion circulated by Justice, not circulated by Justice Alito, but circulated by him inside the uh, U.S. Supreme Court for consideration and review, made it into the public domain. A horrific situation unprecedented, I would offer, in the history of the Supreme Court that a leak of this sort gets out there, but plainly um, uh, invigorated lots of advocacy on all sides of this issue. Uh, Plainly, Justice Alito also indicating in that draft, it's probably not going to be the final version of the order, but indicating that he too, along with the other uh, conservative justices, would be inclined to overrule Roe versus Wade. And then perhaps the most interesting coming out of December, the oral argument on the first of that month last year, Chief Justice Roberts, Chief Justice Roberts, um, trying to find some middle ground, uh, trying to knowing that this is his court and knowing that uh, you need five votes to uphold and sort of retain a constitutional right that's been out there for 49, coming up on 50 years, he tries to find some middle ground and says, well, maybe, maybe when it comes to Mississippi that has this 15-week 
uh, ban on abortions, post um, uh, abortion, post uh, 15 weeks, no abortions in Mississippi. Maybe what we can do is we can uh, sort of both affirm that, that that law can remain in place, but we're not going to expressly overrule Roe versus Wade, which again I think is a is a difficult thing to analyze in terms of of legal and even practical implications of that. But plainly, it underscores the fact that Justice Roberts, Chief Justice Roberts, is troubled by the movement, if you will, of this Supreme Court toward a time when uh, the decision in, in Roe versus Wade and Casey may be overturned. And so if you count the votes, which often an awful lot of people have been doing that only in the wake of the leak, the um, really terrible leak of this opinion, this non-final draft opinion circulated by Justice Alito, plainly, if it is to be believed, and certainly the Chief Justice has said, yes, that was a real draft coming out in February, Plainly, Justice Alito trying to adopt some of the positions articulated by his fellow conservative justices on the Supreme Court, incorporating some of that. You see just, uh, shades of Justice Thomas, shades of Justice Kavanaugh, shades of Justice Barrett and others, uh, Gorsuch. Um, all of those sort of make their way into that text uh, in an attempt, obviously, to get them to um, endorse, sign on, concur, if you will, in this position. Again, we don't know with absolute certainty what the Supreme Court's going to do, but very strong indication from both that leaked, inappropriately leaked draft, but more significantly, on the record, on December 1, five, more than five months ago now, very strong sense from the United States Supreme Court that you do have at least a five-vote majority uh, to overrule Roe versus Wade, to turn back uh, 49, almost 50 years of litigation, of concepts under privacy rights in the Constitution, and find that Roe versus Wade is no longer good law in the United States of America. That, I think, by an awful lot of court watchers who are much brighter than I am, is what the prediction is right now. Again, we won't know until the Supreme Court issues that ruling sometime in the next month or so, significant in that it is going to change not only, not only the arc of history with respect to abortion rights in America, and we have seen some of that already, but also implicating many of the things we talked about early on in this particular hour. Joe called in to underscore this notion that it goes beyond just privacy rights. And we talked about rights to contraceptives, Joe did, life, right to life-prolonging medical treatments, end-of-life health care, um, consensual sexual acts, um, rights of families to choose how they define their families and the rights of interracial couples and same-sex couples to marriage. All those things, as we indicated earlier, are derived from this fundamental Griswold versus Connecticut codification of a privacy right in America that, again, probably will not, none of those will be overturned expressly in this upcoming decision in Dobbs, which again is the name of the upcoming case, the upcoming decision, but certainly depending upon the way in which this particular case is written, if it is an implication of the kinds of things that Justice Alito said, um, he was expressed, at least in his unauthorized release of his draft opinion, to say, you know, we're not going down those other roads, we're not having an uh, impact upon any of those other rights we discussed, other privacy rights that have flowed from Griswold. Uh, we're simply articulating here the continued efficacy, the viability, if you will, of Roe versus Wade in 2022. And so we've got a clear indication that the Supreme Court is, in fact, going to issue this opinion sometime soon, dramatically changing, as I indicated, the life, the livelihood, the landscape. Along the way, we know, we know that there are many legislatures, not just Texas, not just Mississippi, that similarly have been anticipating, if you will, anticipating that the Supreme Court is going to overrule this um, and is going to find that uh, there is no constitutional right effectively sending the decision back to the states. And I suspect you all appreciate that, understand that, that if, in fact, the so-called neutrality position of Justice um, Kavanaugh is adopted, that the Supreme Court is simply withdrawing from the field here, finding that this privacy right, at least as to abortion rights, no longer exists, that the states then can take this up. And we know very well, uh, just in recent weeks and months, that there have been states. Here are just a few of them that have adopted new pieces of legislation Undeniably, again, people on all sides of, the, of this very controversial issue would recognize 
these pieces of legislation are inconsistent with Roe versus Wade. And so there are state legislatures coming forth anticipating that the withdrawal of the privacy right will be accomplished. Um, Governor Kevin Stitt um, in um, Oklahoma uh, describing his state as being the most pro-abortion, pro-anti-abortion state in the country um, has gone down that road as have others out there as well, uh, including um, uh, in Kentucky and, of course, in Florida as well. I'm going to take one more break, and then we're going to be coming back to do some other reflections, if you will, on what this means, what the Supreme Court's implications are for future cases, privacy rights, abortion rights, some predictions, if you will, about where we go from here. This is Morning Cannolis with Jim Santel, WAUK, uh, 540 AM, 101 FM. Join us. Stay with us right after the break. Our conversation this morning continues. And we're back for our final moments together. Thank you so much for joining me here in the studio. This is Jim Santel. Morning cannolis. Connor is also with me, my producer here in the studios right on Wisconsin Avenue in downtown Waukesha. This is WAUK 540 AM 101 FM. We're also taking your calls in the last few moments together here. 844-967-2789. Appreciate those who have called in. All perspectives, all views, questions, comments. Uh, that's what America is supposed to be about, right? And so let's continue with that tradition, not just this morning, but in all the times ahead, including this morning program. We'll be back again next Saturday as well. Before we finish up today, let's chat a little bit more about uh, this Supreme Court case coming up. Dobbs is the name of the case. Uh, it is the one that uh, likely will result in the overturning of Roe versus Wade, or at least the significant rolling back of its implications, presumably sending things back to the states. Right before the break, I was chatting about a couple of, of those states that already have done so. Uh, there are an awful lot of what are called uh, trigger laws out there, too. And uh, those cases, uh, likewise, those states, likewise, uh, presumably will be uh, returning to sometimes old cases, old legislative enactments, other things. Um, we know in Kentucky, for example, uh, Governor Andy Bashir vetoed a 15-week abortion uh, ban, but that was overturned by the state legislature. I also mentioned, of course, Florida. Governor Ron DeSantis there approved a similar bill to Oklahoma and other places, um, talking about uh, viability, uh, a, a non-viability bill, um, no exceptions for rape, incest, um, or human trafficking. So legislatures already anticipating Roe versus Wade, uh, doing things uh, that frankly are inconsistent right now with the law, but may well be consistent with the law as we go forward. What's going to happen down the road here? Um, well, again, predictions are always difficult things to do. We don't know for certainty what the Supreme Court may decide. They could surprise us, but highly unlikely. We know that there already are congressional proposals to codify Roe and Casey introduced in the House of Representatives in the United States Senate. Uh, we know about the dynamics there. So you can, in fact, codify some of those Supreme Court cases through legislation. Those would also be subject to judicial review down the road. Um, we know that there are some state legislatures who are also trying to limit the travel of residents to other states for the purposes of obtaining reproductive services. Question whether or not that kind of legislation will be held constitutional. There is a, from the early, late part of the 19th century, a few cases establishing, yes, a constitutional right to travel, even though the word travel, once again, never appears in the Constitution. You've got that right, whether that would be implicated by and affected by a ban of a resident in one state leaving for another state to obtain reproductive services, initiatives to define life at the time of conception, um, attacking legislation, those states that, that might codify reproductive rights in Roe versus Casey. That is a possibility down the road. And of course, as we indicated a couple of times already, um, arguably some pursuits of the other challenges to privacy right premised uh, established rights in very different areas involving family and medical issues and marriage, sex, contraception. So it's fair to say, I think, that regardless of what happens in a few weeks here, um, that the implications of Dobbs, however it's written, whatever its scope, its breadth, 
I like the decision in Bruin that we talked about before, but especially, especially in Dobbs, because it implicates so many other cases and so many other situations out there uh, that it will have tendrils. It will have an impact upon other areas of the law. And uh, the notion that somehow this will now be put to bed and we will not be discussing privacy rights and reproductive rights following the decision in Dobbs is probably an unrealistic one completely. Before we begin to wrap up the day, we've got a couple of callers on the line, which I appreciate tremendously. Uh, we've got Ross from Middleton. Uh, Ross, thanks for calling in today. Your question or comment? Yeah, hi, Jim. Um, you know, I'm, a, I'm an older guy, so... Uh, I, and I appreciate I appreciate the way you've laid this out. I mean, it's it's some legal stuff that I can't quite wrap my head around. I kind of get, and I, but I think that just I kind of get is is that th- this is this issue is not going to go away. It's going to get even more complicated, which may sort of force us as a nation to sort of say once and for all, okay, let's just do this nationally versus leaving it to the states. Because I think all this interstate sort of stuff is going to get crazy. But the one thing it sounded like you said like was with Mississippi that they. Um, after four weeks or after six weeks, I think you said that is when it starts to get difficult for a it's, woman down there to make the decision. It, sure, and, just to be very, I, very clear, I appreciate that. Just to, uh, it's 15 weeks is the Mississippi law, six weeks is the Texas oh. law. Those are the two, right? So, okay, Texas. Right. So, and I'm right. kind of thinking like, I mean, I, I don't know for sure because I'm not a woman, but uh, is, is that sometimes they don't find out until they have that missed period, and that could be four weeks, and by the time they sort of get to a doctor's office, you're at the six-week number, and it's probably too late. And that's assuming that they're able to pay attention and sort of say, like, okay, I missed my period this month. So, I mean, that six weeks seems, that sounds like, oh, they've got six weeks to make a decision, but I'm kind of like, they might not even know until later. But right. that was yeah. kind of my main comment. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I appreciate the comment entirely, and there are an awful lot of people out there uh, consistent with what you just said, Ross, who would say that that's, that's the problem with this, is knowledge of whether or not uh, a woman is pregnant uh, and the challenge of making decisions without information, right? Uh, quite literally, your own personal medical information, the status of your own body. And that's where those arguments about the right to choose, the right to make those selections, um, consistent with privacy rights, are, are all important. And uh, again, appreciate very much that, that observation, Ross. Appreciate your calling in and look forward to future uh, calls as well. We also have Jack from Merrimack calling in. Uh, Jack, appreciate your hanging on the line for a while. Uh, Jack, your thoughts, comments, questions this morning. Well, first, uh, I'd agree that, uh, as you said, uh, the Supreme Court has overturned a number of previous decisions, but virtually every one of those overturned decisions have increased, not decreased, human rights. And the reversal of Roe would, Ro would do that, would, would, would decrease human rights. But two more things bother me. First, uh, you call the uh, the six justices uh, conservative. I disagree with that description. They're all now, or they have previously been, Federalist Society members. And if they follow through that philosophy of the Federalist Society, they're not conservatives in the normal sense. Their judicial philosophy is reactionary. Right. And, and finally, I'd argue that Amy Coney Barrett has no business on the bench at all. She made a statement that, um, and I'm paraphrasing here, a legal career has one purpose, and that's building the kingdom of God. And that's fine if you're a lawyer, but using that philosophy as a judge or justice is a pretty clear violation of the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment. So, you know, I'm not a lawyer, you said, but, but that's my opinion. And, and Jack, and you don't... Of how she yeah. construes Go ahead. That Go ahead. Is, you know, any decision, in, regardless of how she construes uh, any decision that she makes in this case seems obvious that that's what she's doing. She's right. using that philosophy. Right. And Jack, uh, so uh, three, those are my comments. three very good comments. Appreciate that tremendously. And observations that uh, advance the discussion, again, regardless of what side of these, these issues, these very troubling and challenging issues you might be on, I'll comment on just a couple of them. I appreciate very much, language is important, as we always say, words have, have meanings, um, and uh, the, the appellation of conservative versus liberal justices um, is probably somewhat uh, misleading. You're absolutely right. I appreciate the, the insight and the perspective on that as well, since we often know that in uh, many, many cases, the conservative, so-called conservative justices will, will uh, ally with the so-called liberal justices. And so labeling people uh, in one way or another um, it can be problematic. I agree with you entirely. I think uh, as we think about uh, where the votes will come down, both in Bruin and in 
um, the Dobbs case, uh, maybe we adopted that as sort of a shorthand version, uh, maybe too shorthand in describing um, uh, where people are. Certainly, Chief Justice Roberts is perhaps the best example, Jack, of what you just said, which is he is obviously appointed by um, a president who is generally regarded as, as a conservative president, uh, but um, uh, uh, the, the appellation uh, is, is uh, not always indicative of how justices will, will decide. So very well taken point. Um, and you know, as to others, and I, we had a caller early on in the first, at the end of the first hour, um, who I think underscored in many ways your other point, which is that uh, the administration of law, the delivery of the rule of law in America um, should be apolitical, right? We, that's our aspiration, right? Once you become, you can be an advocate as a lawyer. And yes, Jack, you, you don't have to be a lawyer to, to articulate the very good and thoughtful things that you and others have said this morning. Don't have to be a lawyer at all to understand how, the, how all this works. But when it comes to the advancement, the promotion of the rule of law, um, those things should be apolitical, right? They should be nonpartisan. I've commented routinely about the fact that in my own history of law enforcement, you don't sit around and uh, talk about whether or not this particular prosecution, or this particular kind of a sentencing recommendation, or even issues on appeal, whether that's consistent with a political agenda or a platform, that sort of thing. It has to do with apolitical things. And I would offer that I think what you're saying is that when it comes to justices, they too should not have biases uh, that uh, would indicate so that that is not not their case. Um, more generally, I think you you hit it uh, right on the head that um, the overall arc, the overall arc, as as many folks have said, of human rights, of civil rights in America, has been toward expansion. Even our limited discussion, frankly, our very cursory discussion this morning of uh, civil rights. Uh, we'll chat at some point down the road about voting rights, about housing rights, and those kinds of things. Um, even in the wake of legislative enactments, the, the rule has always been, the movement has always been toward expansion, making things better for Americans, uh, embracing more and more people of all immutable characteristics, and ensuring that that, that promise that we talked about at the start of the hours here to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, general welfare, secure the blessings of liberty, that all of those things are accessible, promotable for every single American, regardless of politics, regardless of who you are and how you live your life. Say, this has been wonderful once again. Join me again along with Connor here in the studio next Saturday at 9 o'clock. Morning Cannolis with Jim Santel will always take your phone calls. Appreciate the thoughtful comments and observations made. Uh, this is WAUK.